We live in times we call the Anthropocene. It's times where humans individually and collectively are changing global biological processes, chemical and geological. We say we will have a new layer of stratigraphy in the future, marking our present on Earth. But uh, the environmental resources that we, we use and the places where we live are the anthroposphere. And as you see, they use all space in our planet. The biggest uh, example we have for the impacts that we have on Earth is climate change. There are other examples. The plastic patch in the Pacific, which is twice the size of Texas, chemicals in penguins in the, in the Antarctic. We actually delivered those chemicals thousands of kilometers away, and then they reached them. So these words, Anthropocene, Anthroposphere, they do not mean just words for the textbooks. Actually, what I want to say to you is that we are changing processes, humans, with its decisions and their rules, we are actually deterring the future of the spheres and also of our grandsons. So how do we change? How can we deal with this? What are the solutions? Brundtland, 40 years ago, proposed sustainable development. She understood that for human activities, and social development to persist, we needed to maintain environmental uh, resources sustainable as well. So we had to work with nature rather than against nature. For that, we needed to bring together economical facet, the social facet, with the environment. So this is the kind of people nowadays we need to solve the problems. They need to understand the three issues simultaneously. They also need to understand that these problems have a holistic global facet, but then they are solved locally by individuals within their communities. And this new rule, a new way of uh, looking for problems and solutions, are at the basis of the process of the Anthropocene where institutions take the lead. But in the end, who's doing the work? It's not the institution, it's us, the individual. And uh, what gives us institutions? So institutions develop a mission that we have to pursue for sustainable development, being uh, green growth, being cleaning a river from pollution, being, solving a problem in a community that is being affected uh, by storms due to climate change. These actions are done by us, and they are always a good quality action if we are able to address them. It's not the institution, once again, I tell you. Institution gives you the framework. So, indeed, I do say that institutions do not change the world, we do. And in this, oceans are not a detail. It's over 70% of Earth's surface. They regulate uh, Earth's climate and also the distribution of species along the planet. They are the best and ready to use infrastructure for trade. 90% of global trade goes by shipping. And then the earth, or the land, better saying, meets the ocean. It's the coastal zone. And this is where 50% of the human population is settled. Rivers as well. And in developing countries, 70% of the protein intake of these uh, communities is actually from coastal fisheries.
But oceans are also the ultimate sink of our activity. Look at this man in a boat, swimming in a sea of plastic, of garbage, not of water. So it's the first element to reflect changes made by the environment. We have sea level rise, for example. We have coral bleaching. We have fixed, uh, fish stocks uh, depleted. And we have uh, in ocean acidification not allowing many uh, microorganisms to develop their own shells, like an oyster. In developing nations, the problem is more complicated. It hits harder. And it hits harder because they have less resources. Financial resources, technical resources. Then we also have less human resources, which means institutions are weaker. So let me talk to you a little about some of my experiences with institutions. What have we seen? What have we learned? As a child, I grew up by the sea in Lisbon. My dreams were populated uh, with images of mermaids, horrible creatures from the depth of oceans. This mysterious one, a horseshoe crab, that uh, goes on history millions of years ago. And I grew up wanting to know more about marine creatures protecting them. Of course, I became a marine biologist when I grew up. And uh, one day I was in the lab, I was counting microbiology through the lens of a microscope, and I felt completely disconnected from reality. Where was my dream of protecting uh, the marine environment, solving the problems? It was far away from that microscope. So I decided to get my hands dirty and move to environmental assessments, which actually show here. This is where I studied in this coastal lagoon. You have airports, you have a city, you have a commercial harbor. Many people living here, fisheries communities. Then you have the ocean that might destroy one of these islands where fishermen are living or where a tourist might have a house. So this was the mix of problems that I wanted to deal with. A particular action of a human, what does it do in the world? And how can we improve it? It was my first hands on approach experience with sustainable development. I started to work with people with different views, sitting to address that problem, giving the best technical advice possible to address uh, each issue. But then, policymakers, just because you tell them what's best, it doesn't mean they will do it. There are other aspects in the agenda. So I joined the NGOs and uh, went to the other side of the world. Instead of uh, doing EIAs, I was evaluating them, trying to change the decision of policymakers. And then I had to deal with people that were able to pull out resources, sit at a table together, communicate, with our communities, pull out the, the problems, and figure out solutions. At the international level of NGOs, I saw colleagues able to communicate in intergovernmental processes, and in the end, they got an MPA. I had another colleague that actually was able, as locally, getting a protected site and where she also did education for children. So these individuals were shaping the agenda, were changing decisions, and they were making a difference. Later on, I was so fascinated with this process of changing the decision, influencing it, and the, all its facets that I decided, okay, I want to know more about the policy process. I'm going to do a PhD in the US on this, of course, in marine policy. And that was part of the part of empowerment. With a global NGO, we would interact with uh, UN delegations, 
provide expert information. We also understood how you have to mingle uh, with them, how you communicate, how you approach. They are all human skills beyond your technical knowledge, beyond what you studied. And globally, especially developing nations, we're requesting capacity development. We need more holistic view, more multidisciplinary view. We also need more capacities to interact with each other. Then in Europe, doing my research, subnational levels were pooling resources, organizing workshops, talking to politicians, delivering positions. And they did change a political process internationally. So once again, I was seeing a process and I was seeing individuals able to pull out resources, able to change. It was not only their technical knowledge, it was their attitude. And this is an important thing to retain. With the leader of the community of Portuguese language uh, countries, we teamed up, me giving him the technical information and knowledge, he leading the political process. We are able to put oceans on the agenda of this institution, and we were able to mobilize eight countries working on oceans. So here, the leader of this institution, he changed actually the direction of the organization. Finally, in IOC of UNESCO, at Inter Intergovernmental Oceanographic uh, Commission, I was able to put in practice what I had learned. People need to develop their own skills to put their knowledge to work. And I got here the institutional support to do it. We also added another component to our capacity development, which was mentoring. We can learn a lot from others. So we included mentoring in a fellowship. We also tailored the capacity building because we know that in each country, with our own cultures and our own language, we perceive things differently. So we tailored actions to match the technical availabilities in the country, financial and cultural. So as you see, I observed and I collected a set of uh, skills. They are not only, all of them over here. There is a set of skills that you learn by doing, by observing, by collaborating with others that allow you to change reality. So, empowerment for the people. You want to address the Anthropocene. Put your institutions to work. Make your individuals the centerpiece of a process, empower them. Holistic view, multidisciplinary view, human qualities. And then, do capacity development in your institutions and in the developing world. Thank you.